Okay, this is a repeat, but for data screening, be sure you run with wide formats. Once you hit the analysis, add the participant number first, and then melt the data. So in between subjects, the participant number thing was just a um, quirk of easy ANOVA, that you had to have it. It wasn't a huge deal, because every person's a different line. But now you really got to have it. Because otherwise, how is it going to know that this is person one, this is person one? So participant number is very important. And then um, the great part about easy ANOVA is it's almost exactly the same code. So that's good and bad. It's good because it's fairly easy to configure. I'll do repeated measures, but it's bad because you have to remember you're doing repeated measures. Um, the nice thing is if you tell it between here, so that's what we've been doing is between, and then you have people in there multiple times, it's, it's like, oh, uh, what are you doing? So within, so we changed it from between to within, and you just put in the IV column name. That's the only tweak I've made. And all the rest of it stays the same. <coughs> So let us try that. Um, I've got the two correlation tables here because that's where normally they would go as part of the data screening. We're going to come back to those at the end and do power with them. So I'm going to kind of skip down to 15 here. Okay, so add the participant number before you melt. Okay. That's really important because otherwise it's going to assume that every person is a different, every melted line is a different person, which is not what you want. So make sure you have a participant number first. And oh gosh, we have to go back to um, using reshape. So I don't think reshape comes automatically. So let me get my couple of package issues installed here. Okay, so while that runs, uh, remember the way that reshape works is it's data set name, ID here. So um, this is a little bit back to a question that Devin asked me a couple weeks ago about repeated measures graphs. So one thing is if you've got a mixed ANOVA, so this will really be important next week, but any kind of mixed design or columns that you don't want to melt, there's two paths to this. So let's think about the test. It had those 20 columns confidence and um, recognition. Yes, recognition. Actually, this is something we had talked about in lab too, where I said, don't do that. <laughs> it works right now, but it won't work later. Um, you have all these columns. If the columns are categorical, uh, MELT will assume, if you leave it out, that you want it in ID. If the columns are not categorical, it will assume that you want them in measured. And that is why you got 10 or 15, 20 bars on your graph. Because what happened is that you put in the data set name, the IV, you put in the two categorical variables that we wanted to stay the same. And then under measure, people just put uh, the recognition average and the confidence average. That data set still had 20 other columns in it. And the function just goes, okay, whatever, and stuck it into measured. And so it created, it melted all 22 columns together. Am I making sense? Right? So you just didn't tell it what to do with the middle 20. So it just stuck them with the other two. So that's why you have such a crazy graph, is because it took all 22 columns and put it into one column for you. So two solutions to that. The big one being, put them here under ID. You don't, if you don't want them to melt, you want them to stay where they are, make sure they're listed under ID or drop them before you start. So if I'm gonna run a repeated measures, and I have, let's say I have like my scale where I have the 20 columns and then I've created an average score, I'll create myself a temporary data set that doesn't have those 20 columns. It makes it much easier to deal with. So that's kind of going back to uh, some issues that we have with graphs. Okay. So the main key to take away here, if you don't quite get what's happening, um, one I can show you in person, that's sitting with you, that'll make it easier. But with MELT, all of the column names need to be in there somewhere. Or who knows what it's going to do with that column. Okay. Sometimes it does what you want, sometimes it doesn't. That's uh, so why I think we had that conversation one day where I was like, it shouldn't have done that. It normally treats you poorly. So, um, so all the uh, column names here. Somewhere, in ID or measure. 
<clears throat> okay. After that saga, let's melt the data. So data set name, columns I want to say the same, which in this case is participant number, and then melt the rest. Okay. Helps if you turn on the library first. <coughs> so now I have my long data set. For each participant, it's got four lines, once for each time. So we're going to control for the fact that they've taken four times and the fact that people are just different people. Click. There we go. I'm going to change those column names, though, because at the moment, participant number and variable and value. I don't, I just, variable and value don't do it for me. Um, especially for the next test we're going to do. They're not very helpful. So I'm going to make them more useful things, such as costume, or what, I called it costume, but it really should be idea, right? Which, um, which bad idea do we have? And then ratings. I'm not going to change it to idea though because it's I've used it five or six times later and it'll be confusing. You don't have to change the names, but um, one of the lessons I think you learned the hard way is like let's say you submit something to a journal and six months later they finally send something back. It helps if you have names that make sense. <laughs> Although I'm guilty as as well of doing that. All right, so I'm going to turn off scientific notation so I can see my p-values. Open up easy. So we're going to run this with the data. Repeated measures one long. Don't use the not melted data. My DV is rating. My within subjects variable is costume or really bad ideas. Participant number, detailed type. Still get that same warning, and that's okay. But we should get this output. Hopefully. So I'm going to get mock this test here, and then the correction piece here. Um, mock this test is not significant. It's starred, but remember the rules 001. So it's actually not significant. <laughs> but you'll see the output looks nothing like Levine's. You get this W, okay, which is um, not epsilon. It is a... Uh, the statistic for that test, and it's not significant. So you can list it as WP equals 0.05. Okay. So not significant, so we don't have to correct. So I already wrote F and eta down here. But F, so 3 and 21, here's F. P is 0.03, here's uh, generalized effect size, or 0.33, okay. which you can treat as eta. Um, great part. No, and it is significant, so we're going to keep moving on. But let's talk about corrections. So it's really not necessary by our data screening rules, but how do they work? So let's say I did want to correct. Uh, what I do is here you see GGE. That GG is for greenhouse geyser. E is for epsilon. So we talked about if epsilon is greater than 0.75, then Hunfeld. If epsilon is less than 0.75, then GG. As long as you notice, they're different. And generally, what I go with is if they're both over 0.75. Because if they're both over, or if they're close to 0.75, you can kind of go with Hunfeld. But generally, they're either both not or both are. If one is and one isn't, you can pick, I guess. So here's epsilon, so I got 0.53. Here's Hunfeld epsilon 0.66. They're both less than 0.75, so I would go with greenhouse geyser. So if I did that, what I would do is use this p-value. So it gives me p next to it. The little p square bracket thing means corrected p. And you can tell here the difference in power. So Hunfeld's a little less restrictive. GG is a little more restrictive. It actually wouldn't be significant. It'd be 0.06. I think that's kind of how I have it listed out on here. Since Heinfeld is less than 0.75, I'd use greenhouse geyser. People report often report corrected DF, but that's not in the output in this example. So you would just say what the corrected p-value is. 
I'm always pro more information rather than less. So I just added it. So I have regular P and then I have correct P. So with the correction, P value is 0.06. Bless you. Bless you. So that's how you would apply a correction if you needed to. Um, the formula here is still sum of squares model over sum of squares total for eta, but in repeated measures, that's a big pain because you really just don't see SS between or the peopleness factor here ever. Um, so we're just going to go with what it has listed, so GES, but understanding that it's the same formula. So this is regular eta. Why is it regular eta? Because it's one variable. Partial eta is for two or more variables. This is regular. We only have a one-way ANOVA, regular and partial, the same thing. I read this really beautiful, oh, can I remember the quote? Oh, God. Uh, is somebody talking about the formulas for ADA, this article we're reading to do a revision? And it's like, uh, either psychologists really love the incorrect use of subscript letters, or people just don't understand that with one variable, it's eta, not eta squared. And they're commenting on the fact that so many people have used SPSS's output and just blindly taken for what it is, because it always says partial, even though that's not right, and just always reported as NP2, um, because we just love subscript letters. So um, it's a comment on the fact that we often report statistics and don't really understand them much more elegantly worded than what I just said, but um, <coughs> I thought it was funny. So omega squared is F and equal. Okay. So all this madness, K minus 1 is degrees of freedom, so that's levels minus 1, n times K is the number of participants, times level, is mean square model, minus mean square residual, all over this disgusting thing, which is this here, mean square residual plus mean square, I think that's a between, minus mean square residual over k, I mean like, oh my god. The simpler form um, that I've found somewhere else is a, a slightly easier, but we don't ever have this. So this mean square effect by subject, that's the between subjects component, or the peopleness over here. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, that's here, subject here. Effect by subject is within here. So either formula is really gross. So we're not. But if Mitchell asks you if you've seen the formulas, here they are. You've seen them. I did my I did my due diligence and have shown you the formula. Okay, so proposed talks, skipping omega. Um, this is a one-way repeated measures because I only have one IV. Um, so we'll still have to deal with independence because it's dependent T. <coughs> and so when I ask you this question on this assignment, it's dependent T. Why? Because it's repeated measures. It's still Bonferroni. Okay, so the answer to post talks is always Bonferroni this semester. Um, the problem is next week when we do mixed designs, we got to get them straight. That's where people tend to mess up. <coughs> uh, the nice thing about the Bonferroni and, and easy ANOVA, so things are very consistent across these chapters, is that the code is the same, so now paired equals true. You don't need this line. Var not equal equals true does nothing for between uh, for the little dependent T. That's why there's a note next to it. Um, but it won't hurt you either. So for cutting and pasting different code snippets, you can use the same one as independent T. Because it's important for independent T to have that in there. You're going to do a Welch correction, even if you didn't mean to. But paired equals true is the important part. So now we're doing a paired T test because it's repeated measures, so we're going to do dependent T. All right, so let's look at that here. So you should get this output. We're going to interpret it the same way. So here's why we, we got to know what we're doing. Because this pairwise comparison, it says the same thing no matter which way you run it. So if you run a dependent T on independent data, 
you've really messed up the assumption here, right? Because um, the assumption is that these are the same people. That's going to give you more power, so it's a type one error. Um, if you run independent T on dependent T, you've lost power. And you haven't control for independence. So understanding what type of data you have is really important. But we would interpret this the same way, so I made the same kind of chart. Since we have four levels, that is six tests, which takes forever to do effect size for. But it's all in there. That's why the code's like 400 lines long, is because it has all the different effect sizes. So I would say my hot to costume is significant. Hot punch. So my haunted house is different somehow from small costumes or punch bowls. And everything else is the same. And then if I look at these effect sizes, they're actually the ones that aren't significant still are kind of large. Uh, and this is the averages. So I'm probably missing effects because I only have eight people. So I have kind of a small power because eight's kind of a small number. <coughs> graphs, as long as you've melted your data correctly, graphs are the same. So the F size script, we would run that. And then I just included all the code. Okay. I'm not going to bore you with like, how all this works. right? But you would just spend some time typing uh, the hot information into costume, hot punch, hot party, et cetera, et cetera, relevant. Uh, oh, I almost forgot the note here. What we've been doing is this. Right, using the link function with tapply. Right. And that tells me there's eight people in each level. Right. The problem with doing it that way is it almost allows you to forget that that's the same eight people in each level. So I purposely did this here on line 48 to help remind you that this is like, uh, these are the number of participants. This is really important for the next test, but I just started it here. Um, so there's only one in for dependent T averages because the it's, it's all the same. So this is the same eight people over and over again. Um, and so you'll see this code, this is very, uh, is not the same as last week, on purpose. So it'll remind me that there's only eight people. Does that make sense? Yes. Because if I'm looking at it this way, I'm thinking, okay, there's eight people in hot and eight people in costume, and it might be easy to forget that this is the same eight people in both. Okay. And then dependent T average, I know we haven't done it in a while, so it's mean one, SD one, mean two, SD two. Uh, dependent T differences would take you a long time because you would have to calculate the standard deviation of the differences for every possible pairwise combination, which is six of them. So I, I like dependent T averages for a lot of reasons, and this is definitely one of them. It's just a little faster. Okay. So we would run all those. Not gonna. All right? They're here in this chart. <coughs> Now, if I want to make a graph, so I run my cleanup code. This is a one-way graph, a one-way bar graph. So data set, aesthetic IV, comma, DV. And then I cut and pasted this bar graph code from chapter four. So it is the same. Damn you, HMISC. kind of important. There we go. Now, we talked, I don't remember when, about being able to look at graphs and compare error bars. And if they don't overlap, that usually means they're significantly different. If they do overlap, that usually means they aren't. Um, in this graph, that's actually true, but don't hold to that. Because the problem with error bars is they're calculated on each group separately, right, each level separately, and it doesn't control for correlated error. So with the graph here, um, yeah, they don't overlap, 
But since this is repeated measures, sometimes they'll overlap and still be significantly different because of um, this thing, controlling for correlated the error here and here. So um, it's not perfect, that thing where you can kind of look at a graph and goes, are these going to be different with repeated measures? But either way, clearly going to a haunted house people thought was a really dumb idea. Um, this is from the book, but I agree. I hate those things. Uh, small costumes, uh, it's almost 80, so sure, that's fine. Okay. Punch bowls, I guess we don't think is a dumb idea. And house parties, like somewhere in the middle. Okay. This is significantly different from these two, and everything else is the same. So you're writing this one up, since everything isn't different, you'd have to kind of talk about, like, this one's more worse than these other two, and then otherwise they're all the same. So we got a lot of error here. Okay, well, let's do power. Power for repeated measures is annoying. Sorry. So let me open G power here. <coughs> so don't forget, there's a G power document on Blackboard that has all of these listed out together. So when you get to the test and you're doing power. <coughs> so our F test is going to be. Oop, oop, what did I do? Click this button, there we go. Test family is going to be F. There's a couple, there's three of them that say repeated measures. And we're going to do within factors. Because everything is within. I'm going to click determine. Direct. And I think it's 0.33. Calculate and transfer to main. Yeah, that's right. Alpha is always 0.5, power is 0.8, and then the next one down. So this is the unfortunate part because I don't think I think this is sort of the best way to estimate this because the repeated measure stuff to me is a little confusing. So the number of groups is actually the number between subjects groups. It's like groups, literal groups, different people. Okay. So we're going to treat that as the number of IVs because we don't have groups. And you can't put zero here. Okay. So we're going to put one, because we have one ivy. <coughs> the number of measurements here is four. Okay. So that's the number of levels. Correlation among repeated measures. So how big is the correlation, or how, what's the smallest one? Okay. If you have no data, and you're truly doing this before you start, and you're trying to estimate, 0.5 is not a bad place. So between 0.5 and 0.7, um, if you have the data, you would get that from data screening. So if I go back, and I could run a correlation table, so that's line 9, and I would pick the smallest one. It would be really beautiful if I could just type min correlation table, but because of negatives you can't. But one thing you can try, actually, sorry, I didn't have this epiphany last night. See if this works. Yeah. Okay. And absolute value correlation. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So the minimum for the absolute values, because uh, if you just do minimum of a correlation table, it gives you the most negative one, which is not the minimum. We want the closest to zero. Okay. So you could change it to that. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't have that moment last night, but that'll help. If you have a big correlation table, this is a small one, but if you have 20 columns, it's hard to read. So I got 0.06 is my smallest correlation. So like this. Close, close, close. So we should have three parentheses at the end. So here, correlation among uh, repeated measures, 0.06. Oops. One. And then if you're going to correct for sporicity, so if you know that sporicity uh, was significant, you would enter either the epsilon under GGE or HFE, whichever one you wanted to correct with. That should say non-sporicity correction with a C. Good grief. 
<clears throat> hit calculate. I actually got seven people. I did this last night and got eight. Oh, because I put in it's actually negative 0.06. Well, that shouldn't matter too much. You can drop the negative, it should give you something close. I had eight of them last night. Alright, so we need eight people. We actually had eight people. So I would still argue it's underpowered for the smaller differences. Eight people is not really enough for normality. That's how you do power. So the worst part to me is this correlation thing because you have to go look it up. Alright. Yes. Nope. Stretching? No, you're fine. <laughs> Not it. <laughs> Alright. Two-way repeated measures. So I know we split one way between and one two-way between is two different weeks. Today we're cramming them all together. But it never does this on my Mac, so I don't know why these slides look fancy on a Windows machine, but whatever. So there's two IVs. Whoa. It's the same participants in all conditions. So these are sometimes called double repeated measures, and I just like cringe every time I hear double repeated measures. Because um, they are more difficult to run because you've got correlated errors sort of twice. Okay. So uh, this is still within subjects, and we're still going to call these something by something repeated measures. Okay. So in our example, we've got uh, they're rating beer, wine, and water, so three, and they're either in positive, negative, or neutral conditions, so it's a three by three, which means there are nine conditions. Okay. So a three by three repeated measures um, ANOVA, so that implies that they, they're in every group. So um, we're looking at the effects of advertising on these different drink types, so we're having people rate beer, wine, and water in either positive, negative, neutral imagery conditions. You should really read this example in the book because he talks about like dead people and the negative ones. Positive ones are very sexy. I think the neutral ones are just like people sitting, drinking water. Okay. So we're evaluating the product from negative 100 to positive 100. It's a really big scale here. <clears throat> and the way that this breaks down as it flies in from the left and right here. Um, I, I took these from the book and I forget that they have these weird animations in them. This is the same idea that we have on the board. So we have our whole batch of cookies that we break into me minus my level. But me minus my level, I'm in two of them now. So we've got the effect of me minus my level for just the drink type I'm rating, me minus my level for just the imagery, and then the condition version. So I'm not going to show you the math on these at all. Just get the basic idea that uh, within participant variance is sort of me minus my condition. And we break that down into just this level, just this level, or j the interaction. Very similar to between subjects. Right, me minus my level, me minus my level, everything else. But here's a new thing. Each one has their own error. So with between subjects, it's me minus my level, me minus my level, everything else, error. Okay, so mean, uh, no, I'm sorry, level minus the gram mean, level minus the gram mean, me minus my level is the error. Um, but with repeat measures, every single one of them gets a separate error term. So we sort of do this for each one. So we're taking sort of me minus my level and breaking that into the levels minus the gram mean and then leftovers three times. So we have some serious cookie division going on. Okay. Um, and the math on this is wildly unfortunate because it has to control for the fact that it's the same people in all of the levels each time. So that's why the error is different for every single one. Because it, it sort of ignores the other IV and then the interaction one includes both of them at the same time. This is one reason why I cringe at these is because there's a lot going on. Uh, this is where a lot of people switch to multi-level models. Profile analysis. It only took me an hour. The P word. 
Profile analysis. Just jumped in my head. I was thinking process and processes is another thing. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that. It's very similar, and you'll notice that this is not in the F table explained. I think there's a little note that says this is gross. So get this idea of I've got the peopleness over here, and then for two way designs, this is essentially repeated three times. Okay. All right. um, and really, what's happening is in between subjects, the cookies go one way or the other. And repeated measures, the cookies are the same. So we have to kind of like partition them up so that they're not repeated across. Like I can't magically have new cookies here, so I have to figure out a way to separate them, even though they're the same cookie. Three conditions. All right, data screen, whole thing in Y format. Uh, so the outliers are appropriately handled, linearity, normality, all that jazz. Okay. Set up their uh, data in the same way, add a participant, melt the columns, the data, and then hold on, we're gonna talk about geo in just a second. So you're going to learn a new function today. Oh, let me go down here to repeated measures two ways. There we go. So here's the problem. Oh, stupid beer column. We're going to fix that beer column. When you have double repeated measures data, it's not like I have the beer thing somehow, or the drink thing somehow separated from imagery, they're all kind of smashed together. So each column is not a level anymore, it's a condition. It's going to present us a couple of small problems, but each condition combination will have its own column. Um, so for example, let's pick on Dr. Yaden's lab. So if they're testing different sensory gating pieces across all of these different um, Head arrays, are you using big array? Just a couple of electrodes. Two, okay, well, that's easier. But so they, they have two electrodes and they're measuring multiple things on those electrodes. So they have each electrode by each time point by each item. So you can imagine how much data this is. <laughs> Huge data sets, right? Millions of columns. Okay. But I can't just say, well, here's all of the data for this electrode and this one item and make different data sets for them, that doesn't make any sense. So you end up with these like, giant columns. Okay. Um, so first, let's fix this column name issue. Call name, names, names. Okay, so rm2, all right, square bracket one. Okay, you should call it beer pause. So if yours has the double I issue, fix it first. At the very end of the semester, hopefully column names will be like the easiest thing. Right. So I'm going to reshape those. And I'm going to have my data set name, participant number needs to stay. And then each of the nine conditions. Now in this measure thing, you can put them in any order you want. They don't have to be in the same order as the data set, but pay attention to the order you put them in because that's going to matter. Okay. I have them in the same order as the data set, but you don't have to do it that way. Okay, so where's the problem really? So there are 20 participants. Um, and what happened is now I have variable and value, but the variable column here is not levels, it's conditions. It's very tempting to run a one-way ANOVA using nine conditions. Don't do that, that's cheating. And you'll have a lot of trouble with it because it isn't stacked. Right? So we're control that we have IV, IV, and conditions. And so now I have to find a way to separate those out. So what we're gonna do. First, I'm going to rename them something useful. Um, so I've got participant number, what group they're in. This really should be what condition they're in, and um, their attitude rating. Do not overwrite the original variable column, because we're going to use it to make sure we're doing this right. So come up with two different columns. I'm calling one drink and one image, because that's what the IVs are. And we're going to use the GL function. GL stands for generate levels. Name of it's base R. 
And the way it works is the number of levels. So for the drink, we have three, beer, wine, water. The number of cases in each level, there's 20 in each one. Total number of cases. Okay, that's how long the data set is. And then whatever the labels are. You will screw this up at least once, because I do it too. So here's where you have to watch what you're doing. So what I always do is I keep this name of this here. Well, that's repeated measures one, sorry. Let's look. Here. So that I can check myself. So for the first one, I'm going to do beer. Well, beer is the first, let's see, 20, keep scrolling, scrolling, beer, beer, beer. It's the first 60 uh, rows. Are with me on that one? So it goes all the way to 60. So there are three levels. There's 60 of them in a row. And then the next 60, and then the last 60, that's why I said the order matters here. So what I did was I said there are three levels, because if you have three here and only two labels here, it gets mad at you. 60, repeat them, 60 times. Total number is 180. So um, these do not multiply together. They do right now, they don't in a second. Okay. So three levels, 60 times, until uh, you hit 180 rows. If you screw it up, you can just renumber it and fix it. That's why I don't overwrite the original column name. So run that. And now you can check. So just scroll down to 60. And make sure it's still beer. Right? So it should match. We've got beer here. Beer here. Wine to wine. That's why I said don't overwrite the original one. Now the second one we want to add is the imagery condition. So I've got positive first, it goes down to 20. Negative is the next 20, and neutral is the last 20. So I've got three levels, positive, negative, neutral. Repeat those 20 times until you hit 180. So what that's going to do, that does not multiply out, right? It's equal 60. Okay. I can do math today. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to repeat this 320 combination until it hits the end. So it's going to repeat that three times. So don't think that this times this equals this total number of lines. It's how many levels, so it knows here how many labels to expect. How many times do you want me to repeat those, the levels, until the total number of lines? That's why I say you'll probably mess this up, but if you don't overwrite the original column, you can at least kind of play with it till you get it. Now I want to make sure that whatever combination I have, beer and positive, beer and negative, matches. So I just kind of always spot check this. Beer positive, beer positive. Okay. Scroll down a little bit where it seems to change. Beer negative, beer negative. You can also sort these columns just to make sure all the positive ones say positive, all the beer ones say beer. So until you've done GL a couple times. I always make sure you check it. <coughs> All right, after that, that's the hardest part. Right. Still easy, Unova. Uh, mapped on to last week, we used that dot function instead of C or list, because that would make too much sense. Right. Variable, comma, variable. <coughs> and... Where's my code here? Here. You should get a whole bunch of sporicity corrections. So, um, sporicity here for drink is significant. So, hence the we definitely need a drink part. Uh, I can be funny every once in a while. Uh, image here, while it says it's got a little star next to it, is not less than 001, so it's okay. And then drink by image, the interaction is not significant. Levine's does not do this by level. It treats everything as one giant group and just runs it. Sporicity does treat it by level and condition. So if you have um, three levels, I'm sorry, two variables, therefore main effect, main effect, interaction, you get each one separate.
But remember, you won't see sporicity if you only have two levels. All right, so we got a fixed drink. Greenhouse geyser is 0.58, Kornfeld is 0.59, so we go with greenhouse geyser. And we would list this corrected p value. The fact that this is the same as the last one is it just a coincidence. P is less than 0.03. And so I would report all three of those. Remember, you ignore the intercept here. So for drink, I've got 2 and 38. Is, here's F. And I reported both P's. So P equals 0.01 for just the regular ANOVA, but the corrected P value is 0.03. This is partial eta squared because we have multiple variables. <coughs> and so that's an almost a large effect. Imagery was very big effect. And the interaction is also significant. Cause fake data. Right. <coughs> um, so hopefully at this point we're getting used to how to read the output and report it. Everybody's doing fine on that so far. So what now? The reason this code's so damn long is because I put in how to analyze the main effects. But remember we talked last time about if the interaction is significant, people often ignore the main effects. And in that case, since all three of them are significant, it's really probably a good idea. Because how many possible combinations could we do? A lot. A lot, a lot. So if I have just drink, so back to family versus experiment. Ooh, my handwriting's bad. For just drink, there's three levels. So that means there's three comparisons. Beer to wine, beer to water, water to wine. wine. Thank you. <laughs> Pray for So that means there's three I can add to the experiment total. Right, remember, experiment's a total at the end. Image has the same issue. So there's three. Right. Positive, negative, positive, neutral, negative to neutral. The interaction, though, is a lot. So the interaction is a three by three. So in this case, no matter which way you split it, it's a square design, so I could split either direction. It's going to be a lot. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No matter which way I go. Six, fifteen, yes. So family wise, I'm either doing three or nine. So for main effects, I'm doing three. For interactions, I'm doing nine. So if I ask you about family wise, there's not one number. It's usually more than one. Experiment-wise, if I control for everything, it would be 15 tests. So that's why a lot of people will just pick the interaction, because they're both part of the interaction. But in the code, I gave you examples on how to do both in case you only get a main effect. Yeah. Ooh, fun. Okay. So I'm going to skip main effects because we basically just talked about how to do main effects. So pick a direction, across or down. How many comparisons? We just did that on the board. This is the same rules, so the two-way between subjects, same exact procedure. So I'm going to split the data on the larger number of levels. In this case, there isn't one, so I just picked imagery and then analyze the data of the other variable. So if you get an error, that zero by zero error, you've split on the same variable you're analyzing. So switch one of them. And then repeat, so this is gonna be nine tests. Oh, and I made a table. But, let's look at it here. So if you skip down past all this stuff um, where it says interaction simple effects, I 
am going to split my data set into three data sets. So I've got one for positive, one for negative, one for neutral. I'm going to run my pairwise T on drink since I split on data set. And I'll get three comparisons for each one. So wine, beer to wine, beer to water, wine to water. For positive, negative, and neutral. Okay. Now, for the means, what you have to be careful about doing is analyzing the post hocs in the, I'm adding dependent, uh, one, two, three, adding the averages to the right dependent T. So many D words here. Um, <coughs> So it's really easy, because I, I did this last night, where you have, it makes you this pretty chart, but if it isn't in the same direction that you were analyzing, to type the wrong ones. So I split on imagery condition. So that means that I'm going to have um, beer to wine, beer to water in this column by itself. But if you split the other way, you're going to be doing one to two, one to three. Does that make sense? So picking the right pairs of means which is why it's probably easier to run the test and make this table and add the effect size to the table. So you make sure you're pairing the right two together. So I want a positive add comparing beer to wine. So here I would look at positive beer to wine. And those are not significantly different. So positive ads are we're getting the same rating for beer and wine. But in a positive ad, comparing it to water, it's also not different, except wine is better than water. Okay. So beer and water is giving me the same results, but wine is much more preferable. So you'll see our, our p-values are going to vary a lot, because we're controlling for a lot of tests each time. You know, this is a, kind of a lot of post hocs. And so with a large number of post hoc tests, it's much easier to make a table. So that's what an APA table looks like. I don't have the header on it. Um, but if you are doing an assignment with a lot of these kinds of values, you can make yourself a table. Much faster than writing out nine different tests. And it also gets really tedious, writing out nine different tests. But the thing to notice is that it has the condition name in here. So this isn't just beer to wine. This is only for positives. So be sure you're listing the condition name here. That also is true for the homework that's due today, right? If you're making this table, condition oh, names. Oh, our, oh, just kidding. It's Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wednesday. The homework that is due Wednesday. Condition <laughs> names. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not due to Wednesday. JK. <laughs> All right, so then the code goes through all nine of these combinations. So that's why I always recommend giving yourself labels of what you're doing. And then it goes through a double repeated measures graph, which as long as your um, two IV columns are set up correctly, it shouldn't look too crazy. I left this one colored, but I could have made it black and white. This is a weird graph because it's also negative, but the data could have been negative. And it really, uh, because I'm comparing within each imagery condition, I stuck those three together. So remember we talked about with interaction graphs, it helps if you stick the, the ones together that you're comparing. So I could tell beer and wine are not different, but wine and water are. I think on this one, beer is sort of always positive, even on a negative ad. Um, but you get very negative for wine and water. And then in a neutral condition, water is perfectly neutral, okay. uh, but beer and wine are still positive. <coughs> so we're trying to get people dr to quit drinking and driving, which was, I think, the point of this example. Um, it's not working for beer, really. Maybe for wine. <coughs> it's a pretty graph. Now, power is the exact same combination. So it's still repeated measures within factors. We don't want to use between at all, because we don't have any between variables. Uh, so let me see here. What did I do? 
I think, yes, partial a to squared is 0.14. So I'm going to hit determine, direct, 0.14. So calculating transfer to main, 0.05.8 number of groups. We've got two IVs and nine conditions. This is going to overestimate the number of people you are going to need. Because it's going to give you numerator DF here, and it's going to be eight, which is not actually the numerator DF. We've got three by three, so it's three minus one times three minus one, so it's four. But this will overestimate the number of people, and that's never a bad thing. Our lowest correlation, go back to the very top, data screening, okay. was well, 0.04 if I round up. And I'm not going to correct for sphericity because the interaction didn't need it. So at this point, I'm going for the interaction analysis, because otherwise, why? Why are you doing both variables? Why? Okay. And it says I need 12 people. I don't have 20. Oh, 20. That's important. Hold that thought. Beep, beep, beep. So another reason, kind of in the middle of the code here, but this effect size thing I treat it as the participant number is because if you use T apply and you're doing main effects, you're going to overestimate N. Because once you melt the data, there's 60 lines for beer. If you tell it to do T apply, it thinks there are 60 people in the beer condition. There aren't. If there's just 60 scores because it's got three conditions or levels, separate levels. And so that's why for N here, I'm always doing length of the participant number so that I know every single time the answer on that is 20. There are 20 people in the study, but they've taken, they've done uh, 60 ratings each. No, 60, uh, nine, right? Yeah, they're in every single level. They have nine ratings each. Nine times 20 is 180. Yes, that makes sense. Um, but if you use T apply to do the main effects, it gives you the wrong N. And so that's why it says note here. <coughs> all right, all of that being said, I think that's it for power. We only needed 12 people, so that would be good. Yes? Where did you get partial eta from for your G power? Uh, okay, so 0.14 mm -hmm. I pulled from the interaction. And I think that was the thing I didn't say on this slide. If you're doing main effects, the number of measurements is the number of levels. If you're doing um, interaction, it's the number of conditions. Okay. And then this should just say number of IVs, because we have more than one now. <laughs>